you very much for the invitation to speak here. It's a great honor and a great pleasure. Um, so everything I'm talking about today is, uh, maybe I'll start here. So it's joint work with Andrew Snowden. And the goal is the construction of integral structures on Durham cohomology of varieties over number fields. But I, 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 so I would like to start off with an apology. Uh, this is work in progress. We haven't yet completely finished writing everything up. Uh, I ordinarily do not like talking about things like this, but I've, there are many people in the audience that have seen me give talks recently, so I, I didn't want to <laughs> repeat myself. Okay, so uh, the, as I said, the goal is to construct integral structures and draw on cohomology over number fields, but as, for motivation, let's sort of, and this is how we came to this problem. Let me try and recall the situation over the complex numbers first. So delta will be an open unit disk inside C, contains zero. Delta star is the punctured disk. And I give myself the information of a family, which is smooth and projective. Uh, or the puncture disk. I sort of don't specify its behavior on the boundary. So here's a picture. And the central fiber could be horrible. I, I don't want to think about it. But away from the central fiber, it's nice. Um, OK, so in this situation, one has the following fundamental invariant. So it's the Durham cohomology of the fibers. To each point of uh, the puncture disk, you associated the, the Durham cohomology of the fiber. As the point varies, you get a, a vector bundle uh, over the puncture disk. And this is, in fact, a vector bundle with a flat connection coming from Gaussmannian. So the question that motivates this is, does this bundle have a natural extension to delta? So, question. All right, OK. I'll try to follow, follow Laurent's strategy, where I only use two words. But does, uh, so let me give this a name. I'll call it Romani, H-I Duram of x over delta star. Have a canonical. extension to delta. I mean, of course, it extends as a bundle, but we wanted to, the extension to be sufficiently functorial. And the answer, I mean, this is not a new question, and the answer is also not new. So the answer is yes. And in fact, there are sort of many constructions. I'm going to review a couple of them first, because the piatic ones will be direct analogs. So the first one, I'm sort of, it, it's more of an abstract construction. It doesn't use the geometry of the situation. So you start off with this local system, or bundle with connection, on delta star. And you use the geometry to conclude that this uh, the associated local system is a quasi-unipotent monodromy. Meaning, when you sort of look at the representation of Z that you get, uh, the matrix is uh, unipotent. Uh, and then it's a fundamental theorem of Duane, I guess proven here, uh, that uh, there is a unique extension, and one can characterize it in a nice way. So it's a bundle on delta. It extends E. And of course, there are many such choices, so one has to say what one wants. Uh, so it satisfies two properties. I'll try to write them here. So the first property is that the gauss mounting connection extends to a logarithmic connection.
So log zero, in this case, I'm working over a one-dimensional base, so it just means uh, I look at the divisor of uh, zero, and I allow sort of poles of order one there. Um, and then there's a second condition. So I guess I. All right, this is the. This two as the family extends to no quasi unipotent order one. Sorry. Do you assume that the family extends to something to a proper thing over delta to know that there is a. Yeah, so I'm putting myself in the algebraic situation. That's the one I have in mind. But. Uh, okay, so um, there's one condition, and the second one, sort of, there's still a z worth of choices at this point, uh, roughly corresponding to the fundamental group. So one needs to uh, make a distinguished choice. And the distinguished choice is that sort of the monodromy operator. So n, which is the residue at 0 of delta. So it simply means you look at this map and look at its fiber. I mean, you look at the matrix coefficient of dt over t, if you like. Um, so this is a matrix. And you assume it has eigenvalues. And uh, half open interval zero one. Oh yeah, sorry. No. Yes. Yeah, the matrix is a matrix. And, and so there's a unique one with this properties, and the construction is actually functorial. So I'm going to make a few remarks about it. So this is what is called the lower canonical extension. Sorry? Since it is quasi unipotent monodromy, you automatically you don't need to worry about the real part. The statement is still correct. But yes, um, yeah. So this is the lower canonical extension. I say lower because I mean there's the other choice, which is you so you use the other interval on the other side of zero. That's called the upper extension, and these are not the same, but they're in fact dual to each other. Um, the most interesting case geometrically is when n is actually nilpotent, or this is sort of the typical case, and this sort of corresponds to uh, this. Uh, bundle E having unipotent monodromy. I mean, this is, after all, the logarithm of. And finally, I want to sort of recall one last property, which is that this construction is sort of, you can do it after a base change. And this is why I use the lower one as opposed to the upper one. So if you choose a finite cover, uh, G, so you just extract an nth root of the uniformizer, then uh, so I get a pullback bundle, G upper star V. Now it's a bundle on this copy of delta star, and I have the associated lower canonical extension there, and then I can intersect it with my bundle E downstairs. So just take the inverse image lattice, and this is E as sub bundles of as subsets of E. So in other words, you can, you can do a finite base change, compute the lower canonical extension there, and come back down. And this is sort of what we'll be using in the geometric setting. Uh, sorry, in the arithmetic setting. Ah, uh -uh, stop. Okay, so I mean, this construction is purely abstract. It works in, it stays in the land of differential equations. Uh, one sort of might ask for a more geometric construction, and it does exist. And so let me sort of briefly just say what it is. So for this, you need to, uh, so we invoke Hironaka. So now I'm really placing myself in a situation where I can do that. So I choose. 
so model x over delta where the reduced central fiber has simple normal crossings. So I no longer had that horrible picture I sketched. Sort of much nicer. And in this situation, you can sort of regard x to delta as a log morphism. I mean, in particular, one has an associated log Durham complex where you allow logarithmic poles along uh, these components. And it's a theorem of Steenbrink in generality and cats when the multiplicities are 1 that uh, the log Durham cohomology of such a model computes the lower canonical extension. So it's HI. I guess I should give, let me give this morphism a name, F. So it's, uh, well, I guess it doesn't matter. So you look at the relative log Durham cohomology with logarith logarithmic poles along uh, this uh, central uh, divisor, and you look at its log Durham cohomology, and there are two assertions here. One, that it's a bundle, and secondly, it's sort of this extension. In particular, it has the sort of correct unipotence properties. Okay, so these are the two sort of abstract constructions in uh, over a punctured unit disk, which give us uh, natural extensions of uh, Durham cohomology to uh, the boundary, and I want to try and mimic them in the arithmetic setting. No, by, by virtue of the comparison, it doesn't. But it just gives us a way to compute it. So, I mean, for example, you can see those eigenvalues geometrically. And this is going to be, an, of course, it's going to be a big problem in the phiatic setting. Where we don't have models, and dependence is not clear, and so forth. OK, so in the arithmetic setting, let me sort of write down the result and make some remarks about it. And then uh, we'll sort of see the actual construction. So let's say k over q is a finite extension. And x over k is a nice variety. So here, nice is actually a technical term. Uh, I learned it from Bjorn Poonen. It means proper smooth and geometric, uh, projective smooth and geometrically connected. <laughs> it's, but I, I like it. It's quite short. And so the theorem is that uh, in this situation, if you look at the, uh, and so you fix an integer, sorry. If you look at the uh, Durham cohomology group of x over k, algebraic Durham cohomology, then there is a canonical lattice in there. So there exists a canonical. So I mean, of course, everything here is hidden in the word canonical. Um, it doesn't depend on the model of x. Over well, there is no model inside. But it, it, so it's, yes. So there's a canonical lattice. It's functorial in x. Um, and there are some other properties, but maybe I'll sort of I'll state them under remarks. And we'll see what they are. So the first remark is that this is sort of a lie in the spirit of uh, Jared's talk. It's kind of a white lie. Uh, we don't actually have a canonical lattice. We have at least two. I mean, it's easy to see that if you have one canonical lattice, you can scale it by five, and you'll get another one. But that's not what I mean. Uh, there's really two genuinely different constructions. So we actually get two, well, probably different. Certainly, I don't know how to prove that they're the same. Two different such lattices, both somehow uh, corresponding to the two constructions I had earlier. So you can copy Deleen's abstract construction and using integral piatic Hodge theory, and that'll give us one lattice. And then we can also copy the Steenbrink construction in some way, and that'll give us a new lattice. So there's the Galois theoretic one. Q, Q, Q. Uh, I'll, say, I'll, I'll make a comment on that. So yeah, I mean. No, 
No, no, no, these two are different. You can define duals. But you get two more. You get a lot more. I mean, you can just. <laughs> I mean, the, I, yes, I'll say what, what, what they are. So they do have some properties. So if you look at sort of all of them inside the Durham cohomology algebra simultaneously, then this is actually a subalgebra. So it's closed under cup products. Uh, but it is not closed under Poincare duality. I mean, this is the same thing as what happens in the geometric setting, so one shouldn't be too surprised. Okay, and then, the, I mean, where does all of this come from? It comes from, the, the construction is essentially local. I mean, one can state it like this, but uh, you do it locally at all primes, and then you make sure that your construction for most primes is compatible with some standard one. So. So what do I mean? I mean that if P is unramified, so P is a prime of the field K, and it's unramified over Q. Uh, let's see what else. I, I need X to have good reduction at P. So meaning there is some model with good reduction at P. And so to assume that dim X is less than P minus Two, and I think actually, so we need different constants for each lattice. so let me be safe and put a three over here, because that's the maximal one we need. So the dimension is sufficiently small compared to P. Most primes are gonna satisfy these properties. Then this lattice is the lattice coming from the canonical, uh, from the smooth model. So script X is the smooth model. So in other words, if you're trying to do such a construction and you are able to create such local lattices and they satisfy some property like this, then they are gonna patch together, so. Oh yeah, sorry. Oh, 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 everywhere, oh. So it, it really is just a local thing. Um, but there, the, I mean, there are global questions one can ask. For example, I don't know if the determinant of this lattice is an invertible, uh, is the zero ideal in the class group, so. I, I, I expect not, but it's somehow impossible to compute, so. For each eye, each cohomology. Yes, and all of them, I mean, yeah. Not the Poincare characters, no, the Poincare characters. No, directly each group. Yeah, yeah, just each group, each group, each I. Well, it's a, it's a la so by a lattice, I mean a projective module. So yeah, so it makes sense. Well, I guess the terminal makes sense for any module because the ring is smooth, but no, no, that's not what I mean. It's a mod, it's projective. So is it clear that it's independent of the x? Well, it, it follows from the theorem that it is. But I'm saying you can define it like so. You just, a priori, you pick some good model over all of, over like most of spec Z, say, bad at a few points. Mm -hmm. No, no, there is nothing that this thing is independent. Which, what's, when you say the lattice is canonical, what do you? I just mean functorial. All I'm asserting is that there is a functorial lattice. And it took us a lot of work to actually see that. So, um. so in the in the in the geometric case, you have the sort of the upper one and the lower one, and they're dual. But the, but you also know the upper one contains the lower one, and the difference is not very large. It's, right. So do you have a similar statement here that the upper sort of the upper Galois theoretic one contains the its dual, and the difference is bounded by p? Well, it's a power of p that I think depends on the Hodge state weights. Oh, okay. But, but yeah, you have that kind yeah, of... In one of the constructions. Yeah. And for, okay. The, the, yeah. Um, 
And the, so the wonder mark I wanted to make is that, I mean, I, this, this, one shouldn't really view this as a final result along on this problem. I mean, there should be a better lattice. We just don't know a good way to sort of ask what we want from this lattice. Uh, we wanted functoriality, and that's what we were able to get so far. Uh, but for example, you can ask if there is sort of natural torsion. If you're completely ignoring torsion in this discussion. Um, and that I don't know. Is there some functoriality in the uh, Yes. In the sort of obvious sense. Well, the question was, is there functoriality in the field? OK. Oh, but the geometric end, it's not true. If you ramify delta star, I mean, if you, if you ramify mm -hmm. delta, then the pullback of the canonical extension is not the canonical So I mean functorial in the stupid sense. There's a map. I'm not saying it's the whole thing. Yeah. So you can try to do a construction. <laughs> Instead of models, take the projective limit of all models and take some, something like omega log, log. If you wait for 10 minutes, <laughs> it's more or less what I'll do in 10 minutes. <laughs> so I want to first talk about the Galois theoretic construction. So this is uh, why we'll have to wait for 10 minutes for the other one. So uh, this is the cleaner one. Uh, it's good, it, it comes from sort of good integral piatic Hodge theory, which is my excuse for talking about this here. Um, so, so this is why I left the two boards. So I'm going to have a board of notation now. I mean, it's the standard notation, but one has to say it. So p is a prime, uh, k over qp. Is a finite extension. I fix an algebraic closure k bar. Let's see, what else do I need? Uh, I'll need many things in a moment. Th this k is different. So the entire discussion is going to be local from now. And so I, yeah, so I start off with x over k nice. And yes? Uh, and we want to construct this canonical lattice in there. And so the idea is sort of naive. And it's rather simple. You, you want to create a lattice in Durham cohomology that's functorial. We don't have that yet. We do have a lattice in Etal cohomology that is functorial. And you use that. And you transport it across the piatic comparison isomorphism. So Zp want torsion. Is a lattice in QP. And so we take this lattice, and this is so everything is GK equivariant. Aha, uh -huh. GK is the Galois group. And so you just transport this lattice along the period isomorphism. So I'm going to think of the period isomorphism as saying that D Durham of this object is equal to a tal cohomology, uh, Durham cohomology. OK, and then of course, I mean, one has to actually go through the machinery and see that this can be done. Uh, if, the, if the field is unramified, the dimension is small, and uh, you have a good reduction, then sort of this is due to Fontaine messing. If you sort of assume that all of the above, except uh, the field is no longer unramified, then one can use Broglie's theory of S modules. And in sort of complete generality, we use Kisson's theory of sigma modules. So I'll very briefly uh, remind you of the main assertions from that theory. So pi, I need to fix a uniformizer. The functors depend a priori. Uh, E of u inside, oh, sorry. Uh, one needs another ring first, which is w. So k0 is the maximal and ramified subfield. w is the ring of integers. So ok over w is totally ramified. Pi is a uniformizer. And E of u is its minimal Eisenstein polynomial.
And this is still not enough when asked to make more choices. So I'm going to use the notation pi underline to denote a compatible system of p power roots of pi. in sort of my chosen extension. And k infinity is going to be k adjoin all these roots. And g infinity is the Galois group of the resulting field. OK. Uh, I apologize. but So maybe one thing to remark is that this is not the same k infinity as in the previous talk. This is not the Galois extension. Um, OK, so in this setting, Kissin defines the sort of following story. One has this ring that I'm going to call sigma, because I don't quite know how to say that. Uh, maybe the audience can tell me what the right pronunciation for that symbol is. <laughs> There's going to be another s later, so let's stick with sigma. Yeah, it is S in, in tech. <laughs> so it's going to be the power series ring in one variable over W in this parameter U. And phi is going to be sort of U goes to U to the P. And it's semilinear over the phi of W. OK, and so one is interested in modules over this ring. And one can specialize them in sort of two ways that are going to be interesting to us. So there's w, and there's ok. And the specialization to w is u goes to 0. The specialization to ok is u goes to pi. Uh, so this is just a quotient by the ideal e of u. So with respect to this ring, Kissin defines the following categories. So mod phi of sigma is going to be pairs, m and phi, where so the M is a vector bundle over sigma. So I guess it's free because it's uh, local. And phi is a map from the Frobenius pullback of M to M. And it has some properties. So the property it has is that its co-kernel is killed by a power of this polynomial E of U. And similarly, sort of one has a rational category, which I won't write out. And the, sort of the miracle of, of this theory is that this category is rich enough to detect uh, integral semi-stable representations, and is yet somehow over a much smaller ring than one might naively expect. Oh, yeah, sorry, power, power. For sufficiently large n. OK, so theorem. This is Kissin's theorem. That after you make all these choices and you define this ring, sorry, um, there is a functor. And I, I'm not going to state the theorem in, its, uh, in the most generality. I'll just state it in the context in which I'm going to use it. So it's a semi-stable QP representation of GK to mod phi sigma join 1 over P. So I'm going to denote the functor as V goes to M of phi. And it satisfies the following two compatibilities. So first, there is a canonical isomorphism between a specialization of this module and Ram uh, D to Ram. So, so fix your V in this representation category. So there's a canonical isomorphism. Uh, it's not between just the U equals phi specialization, but you have to sort of compose it with the Frobenius.
So when you go all the way down to the fraction field of OK, K, you get the gramophy. So it's some integral object that lifts d to ram of v for the purposes of my discussion. And it's not just any integral object. There's actually a nice correspondence between integral objects on both sides. So there exists a natural bijection, which goes lattices in this representation v that are stable under not the full Galois group, but g infinity. And sort of, so this is a rational uh, Sikissen module, uh, M, and you can study integral forms of it. And that's what I have here. So sigma forms of M. So integral Kissin modules equipped with an isomorphism between the thing with P inverted and your given one. So bijection. OK, I, I'm sorry. I'm trying to make one point with all this notation. Um, so we can, the point is we can just use this to get a canonical lattice. And so in our application, wait, is there a question? So if you start off with x over k, which is nice, and you set v to be the etal cohomology, of xk bar, coefficients in qp. And inside here, you have this lattice t, which is the zp etal cohomology modular torsion. Then you're in the setting where Kissin's theorem applies. So well, sort of. First need to assume v is semi-stable. So, V is semi-stable. I have a lattice in there. So I get a natural sigma form of the associated Kissin module M. So we get some M in this category and an isomorphism. With D to ROM of V up to you specialized to K in this manner. And by the piadic comparison isomorphism, one knows that this is equal to hi to ROM of x over k. So it's sort of obvious what to do. You just look at the image. So you define this lattice hi x that we seek as the image of composite. So this is the semi-stable picture. If you change the Eisenstein, uh, I mean the uniformizer, or you change k, this is compatible? Or no? Yeah, I'll say that. I mean, yes, but it's a theorem. Uh, so for general x, so you, here I assume that the representation was semi-stable. A priori, all we know is that it's potentially semi-stable. So there's some extension over which it's semi-stable. But then sort of, this is why I went through this geometric construction earlier in the uh, complex setting, where you can always sort of, the, comp the construction of the lower canonical extension is compatible with intersecting from uh, field extension. So you just do that. So you choose. L over k finite, such that v restricted to L is semi-stable. And you define hi of x as hi of sort of xl intersected with this Durant cohomology. So. OK, that's the definition. The, po the, the point I want to make with the definition is that it's sort of a very easy consequence of integral piadic Hodge theory that one can define such an object. What is not clear is that it's independent of all the choices that were made along the way. And this is, in fact, true. So so I chose a uniformizer pi. I chose this polynomial e. I chose a compatible system of p power roots pi underline. I chose this field extension L. Uh, and it's independent of all those choices. Uh, so we had actually uh, 
proven this about two years ago in sort of restrictive conditions, meaning we needed to assume something about the hot state weights of uh, V or uh, the, the, the sort of difference between P and the ramification index of the field. But recently, Tonglu just proved this in general. So it's, it's completely canonical. And moreover, under sort of good conditions, it is compatible with the, uh, with the sort of easy lattice, if you like. So x has good reduction, k equals k0, and the dimension of x is less than p minus 1. So you can use uh, Fontaine-Messing arguments to, uh, and some sort of compatibilities between Kisson's theory, Broglie's theory, and uh, fontaine lefay theory to get that this is the usual lattice. OK, so that's the construction of the lattice in this sort of abstract Galois theoretic framework. Uh, it relies, I mean, obviously, sort of the main work is being done by this theorem over here. Yes? Yes, yes, there's no x needed, it's just v. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, yeah, so that's why I somehow wanted to think of this as an analog of Dillian's construction, where it somehow works in the world of differential equations over the disk and uh, doesn't sort of think about the geometry. Um, I, I sort of, I mean, it's, it, if you're sufficiently familiar with these aspects of integral piatic Hodge theory, it's not very hard to come across this construction. Uh, at some point, I took it to my advisor at the time, De Jong, and he sort of immediately recoiled. And he insisted that there should be some sort of a geometric way of seeing such a functorial lattice that doesn't go through sort of all this machinery. And so this is what I want to describe in the rest of the talk. So this is the geometric construction. Local. They're both local precisely because of assertions of this sort. That if you're in a sufficiently uh, generic situation, then it agrees with the lattice coming from a model and is independent of the choice of that model. So you can always sort of construct it as the finitely many bad places. So the, once again, x over k is nice. Uh, I have my integer i. And the idea, which was already pointed out maybe more than 10 minutes ago at this point, is you just want to look at semi-stable models. So we want to copy Steenbrink's construction and say, OK, pick a semi-stable model, look at the Durham cohomology of that, and try to prove it's independent of the choice. Of course, there's many things wrong with this. You don't have a semi-stable model. It's not going to be independent. But you can do the next best thing, which is you quantify over all models. So you just look at those differential forms which, remain, which become integral on every possible semi-stable scheme over your variety and hope that this is actually large enough. So I'm, once again, I'm trying to define a lattice in this uh, k vector space. And I want to look at those omegas, which are integral on all semi-stable uh, schemes or varieties over x. So at least this is how I understood your suggestion of Doing a pre bigger field, bigger field. You need the bigger. No, I thought to do it. When I'm not sure it can be done. It's some fine study of the in the risk Riemann space without. Of course, there you have a problem of resolution of singularity. Okay, so I'm not sure about it. But the idea was from experience that, that if you assume enough resolution, you should mimic it by consider uh, the log structure relative to the special fiber take omega log relative to the log structure downstairs. This should mimic. The, the log, the log construction for semi-stable. But the problem is to prove things about it. So it's okay. Yeah, I did not what you do in any case. So. Yeah, I mean, in the in the arithmetic setting, another problem is the multiplicities. I mean, you can have sort of p's in the multiplicities of the central fibers, even if you assume resolutions.
But OK, so I mean, this is the idea, and I would like to formalize it and state a proposition. So let me make the following, uh, define the following category. So SS of x, it's just going to be, I mean, this, semi-stable varieties over x, except I want to sort of state it formally. So it's going to be diagrams like so, where x is your fixed guy. This is some morphism. And y is nice over some field extension, which is finite, over k. And it has a semi-stable model, namely x. For a lot of what I'm going to say, you can actually replace semi-stable with the uh, log smooth of Cartier type. You mean OK one? OK one. Oh, yeah, sorry. OK one. Thank you. Um, but let me just sort of stick with the more intuitive terminology. Uh, OK, so these are all the collection of pairs I want to work with. And uh, the one sort of naive observation is that whenever you have such a datum, y, y, and x, you get a log scheme, which is this guy, y over OK. In particular, you get its log Durham cohomology, and this gives you an integral structure on the algebraic Durham cohomology of y. Okay. And it can be any morphism. F can be any morphism, absolutely. So this is, you can sort of, there's two games you can play. You can either put conditions on f to make it easier to show that you get a lattice, but then you have to work with, to get functoriality. I'm going to just work with all morphisms, and functoriality will be built in, and then the hard work is to show it's actually a lattice. Um, so I'll use different notation, uh, am I, because it's not equal to the lattice from the previous discussion. So this is going to be all classes. Here, so f upper star of omega is integral on each of these triples. I mean, this is obviously functorial. If you have a map from x to y and an object over x, you get an object over y. So this is this this subgroup or sub OK module of my drum cohomology is clearly functorial. It's also clear that it's compact because there is some lattice on which it's integral, so you can intersect back down and you get something nice and small. The only non-trivial content is that every, so this is large enough. In other words, whenever you have a Durham cohomology class, say omega, there's some multiple of that class, which is integral simultaneously on every possible semi-stable scheme that lives over your x. And so that's the proposition. Maybe I say this is one and two. It's the analog of uh, what I had in the previous uh, construction. So if x over k is good reduction, k is equal to k zero, and here I need three dimension of x to be small. Comes out of the pr uh, the proof. Then this is equal to the lattice coming from a model. modular torsion. So in other words, if you do this globally, then you actually do get a lattice. <coughs> Is this something like uh, age blooming of the integral versions of Hyodo Kato base extensions? In a very sort of stupid sense, I'm not doing any homotopy theory here. I just fix my rational vector space and I just search for things that are integral in there. I don't sort of care about if they're homotopic over the double overlaps and so forth. So, I mean, I don't know a nice shift theoretic way of saying this. Okay, so in the remaining part of the talk, I would like to explain what goes into this. And it, at least from my point of view, there's a lot of technology that goes into this. So some of it is known, and we had to sort of discuss, develop extensions of some known things. So I'll try to uh, explain what they were. 
So the idea of the proof is very simple. I mean, you want to show that every, uh, as I was saying, you want to show every class has a multiple that becomes integral on a model. Now, we have no idea how to do this a priori. Like, you have some model, and there'll be some multiple that works, and then there'll be a larger model, and there's some other multiple that works, and there's no compatibility in this process. But there is compatibility on the side of piadic etal cohomology. And so the idea is to have an integral piadic comparison isomorphism between Duram and etal, and then try to use that. So. Does, uh, what depend on the vanishing? No, no, it's not going to depend on my vanishing theorem. It's going to depend on a slight extension of uh, De Jong's alterations work. Um, so you use integral piadic comparison theorems. And I said theorems in quotes because one doesn't have such isomorphisms. They're only maps. But one, the maps have sort of bounded kernel and co-kernel, and we can try to use that information. OK, so here are the main tools. And I will sort of work in a slightly uh, different setting. So I'm going to assume now that this x is semi-stable. I mean, after all, all the work I'm going to do is not going to be on my given x, but it's going to be on this category, SS of x. So I'm going to assume x over k is nice and has semi-stable reduction. So semi-stable model, say. Script x over OK. And d is going to be the dimension. the relative dimension. So I want to tell you first what these uh, uh, integral comparison theorems are. In order to do that, I can't just work with the Ram cohomology. One has to work with a slightly richer object. So first, I work with log crystalline cohomology in sort of the ramified sense. Um, and let me sort of tell you how this. So I have this log scheme, x over w. X is given the log structure coming from the fact that it's a semi-stable scheme over OK. Uh, w is given the trivial log structure. And that gives me a site, the log crystalline site. And this site has a morphism down to the log crystalline site of just the base. I will give this a name f. And so associated to this datum, you have, you can, I mean, you can do cohomology. So in particular, you have the push forward. So RF lower star of OX over W L Chris is an object. And it, so it's a crystal. It lives on, on the site. And it's sort of very instructive to think of it as a crystal. But uh, I mean, just to understand the functoriality. But uh, to work with it, well, I'm going to use a specific specialization, which is Broy's ring. So I'm not going to need Kisson's ring anymore, so I can delete this. And so I'll do the analogous thing. So once again, let me say in words what I'm trying to do. I have this crystal, and I want to access its values. To access its values, I have to tell you what it looks like on a really large PD thickening of OK over W. And that's what comes from this choice of. So S is you take W to join U, the polynomial ring. You join divided powers of the kernel of the map from w u to OK, which is given by setting u to pi, and you periodically complete it. And so this is a versal PD thickening of OK over w. So in particular, it makes sense to evaluate this crystal on that thickening. And the result is what I'm going to call E Chris of x. It should really be script x. So it's So this was a sheaf on the crystalline side. So when I evaluate it, I get an object on each ring. So I get an object of the derived category of S modules. And this object has really nice properties. So um, one needs some of those properties. So the first property is that it's perfect. I mean, it is very tempting to just guess that each of the individual cohomology groups are nice. I don't know if that is true. I certainly don't know how to prove it. Um, what one does know, 
just by sort of easy derived arguments, is that if you look at the full complex, then it's a perfect complex. But I, since I don't even know if the string S is coherent, I, I, I can't say anything about the individual groups a priori. Uh, secondly, by functoriality, it has some natural structures. So it has a filtration, has a phi action compatible with the induced phi action on S, and it has a connection, uh, a logarithmic connection with respect to the parameter U. Um, sorry? It depends on the model. Yes, 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 sorry. So I, yeah, this object certainly depends. Yes. I mean, the structure sheaf upstairs is an object of the filter derived categories. So I take the push forward in the filtered sense. Uh, OK, so I mean, these are some abstract properties. And what does this actually look like? Well, to actually look like, I can only tell you what it looks like when you specialize. If you specialize from S all the way down to OK, so this is u equals pi, then in fact, you get Durham cohomology. So e Chris of x tensor over S with OK is the log Durham cohomology of this model. So in that sense, it's reasonable. Once again, if I had to say something at the level of individual cohomology groups, I would be lost. So let me stick with the complexes. Um, and similarly, you can do the other specialization, which is u goes to 0. And there, you get uh, the log crystalline cohomology of the central fiber. So it's, this, it's, it's the usual situation one has when one studies uh, Broglie modules over S. You have two specializations. One of them is related to crystalline cohomology, and that's where the Frobenius is coming from. The other one is related to Durham cohomology, and that sort of detects the filtration. OK. So what do we use about these objects? And what do we prove? So the fundamental fact that makes the complex amenable at all to calculations is the Hirokato isomorphism. So one needs to know something about the cohomology groups. And so this is what I'm going to call Dwork's trick. And the assertion is that, OK, this complex would be horrible, but after you invert p, one has some control on it. So theorem. And so I mean, in the non-log case, this is Berthelot Ogus. It's Hirokato in the setting I'm in. And uh, Balenson gave a really nice uh, explanation of this without somehow using explicit complexes. Uh, and it, it asserts the following. So, so as you take this complex and you invert p, then in fact, this specialization, the one to u equals 0, detects everything. So, OK, this can be literally true. This is living over w. This is living over s1 over p. So you just extend scalars. So in other words, you can find a horizontal. First of all, you can find a section back from the u equals 0 specialization. And then you can do a uh, dwarf trick uh, to conclude that it actually extends to an isomorphism like so. But it has the following consequences for us. So now one can actually say something about the groups. So at least this one is nice. Here, here I mean nice in the non-mathematical uh, sense. I just mean it's a, it's a free guy. Um, and the second consequence is that if you look at the map at the integral levels from integral hi sorry, of e Chris to hi Durham, so the u equals pi specialization. Uh, then the image is a lattice. So if I'm trying to prove something about Durham cohomology, I can always lift classes to here up to sort of a fixed error depending on this model and try to work with crystalline cohomology instead. I'm sort of running a little 
uh, short on time, so I apologize, but. Okay, so the main ingredient, which is sort of absolutely where everything, all the control comes from on, as you go across models, is the integral piatic comparison theorem. So I will simply say, in the interest of time, that there is a natural map like so. S to A Chris, A Chris is uh, Fontaine's A Chris, and the map is you send U to pi underline, coming from my choice of uh, compatible system. Uh, this is not Galois equivariant, it's only G infinity equivariant, but that's fine. And so the theorem, so I, I mean, I learned this formulation of the theorem from Faltings. This is work. But I, I mean, I'm not an expert. I think it follows from many of the other approaches as well. So it says that there exists maps back and forth which relate E Chris of X to Piatiga tal cohomology. So CX goes from E Chris of X tensed over S with A Chris. And on the other side, you have a tal cohomology. Uh, I'll call that DX. So the first map is the one that comes from the comparison theorems. It's the one that's compatible with the algebra structure. The other one, the backwards one, is induced by duality. And the composition is just multiplication by t to the d, where t is the usual uh, period of 2 pi i. So it's, it depends on uh, uh, choice of a compatible system of p power roots of 1. Okay, depends on the model. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, I keep doing this. The, in this entire discussion with E Chris, it depends on the model. Yeah. I, I mean, I wouldn't know how to define E Chris without the model. No, well, not because of the theorem, but other than that. I mean, I, I don't know what the question would be if you didn't pick a model. Mm. Yeah, so you know, I'm, I'm, my question is about the left hand side. Depends on, on the model or not. Well, not because, but no, but because only because of the theorem. Well, the left hand side depends on the model, right? Oh, shit. Sorry. It doesn't depend on the model. But I don't quite see a direct way to say this, but you can say it through the. You use the rational comparison isomorphisms. You have piatic etal cohomology, it doesn't depend on the model. You get filtered phi n modules, and then that's what that one is. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm out of time, and I was just about to get to the things we did. Um, so I'll sort of simply state them in a few words. So once again, to prove this boundedness, we first live from uh, uh, Durham cohomology to crystalline cohomology, which is possible by Dwork's trick. You then move from crystalline cohomology to piatic Gattel cohomology, which is a bounded sort of which has some bounded error, thanks to Fulting's uh, integral theorem. And then you sort of try to argue on the side of a tal cohomology. To actually do this argument, we need sort of two more ingredients. And these are both of a geometric nature. So the first, um, in Fulting's theorem, the error depends on the dimension of the variety. If you're working with hi, you want the error to depend on i, not on d could be working with H5 of a thousand dimensional variety, and you want the error to depend on the fact that it's H5. So one needs some sort of a Lefschetz theorem for these groups. So there is a very weak Lefschetz for E Chris. Uh, when I say very, I mean I don't assert anything for a specific hypersurface. I just assert that there is some hypersurface where the uh, usual injectivity and surjectivity properties hold. Uh, and this really uses the perfectness and a uh, recent result of uh, Jensen and Saito on Bertini theorems for lock schemes. And then the second ingredient, and then I'll stop, is sort of de Jong's alterations plus something. And so the result we need is that in the, in the proof, we want to make some alterations in a way that they are etal at a given point. Now, one can do that, but one has to actually prove it. So, control, some control on the etal locus. I 
Meaning, if you have a variety and you're trying to prove semi-stable reduction, the young will tell you there is some alteration which has semi-stable reduction. But what we want is actually when you fix a point downstairs, you can choose that alteration to be etal at that point, finite etal even, uh, which has semi-stable reduction. And you can do this for sort of all points. Uh, and that's what we have to prove. So OK, I guess I'll, I'll stop here because I'm out of time. Sorry. Very much for the uh, questions. So, the semi-stable category, you need projective for, because you said proper, and later on you do lectures. Yeah, I should have said projective. Thanks. Mm -hmm. But there are the implementation that we're talking about daytime, curly uh, uh, Not this construction, no. But what I what one can say is that, so if you have this improvement of de Young's theorem, uh, in Bailenson's paper, he uses the H topology on the generic fiber. And what this allows you to do is work with the etal topology on the generic fiber. So you only ever do blow ups and alterations along the boundary. And this brings it a lot closer to rigid analytics. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, you could recover by taking your gamma uh, A and then. Yeah, I mean, this is what Misha was asking. Oh, this is what I was just elaborating on what Misha asked. I, I couldn't get it to work because of the homotopies. I mean, you're not just saying that you have your class which is integral simultaneously on all models. If you do R gamma, you're somehow saying it doesn't have to be integral on all models, but there's some homotopy on the fiber priority and a d double homotopy. Uh, at least, I mean, I didn't try very hard, but I couldn't see it. It's not enough to take uh, all alterations with the mistable model of the original models. Uh, it is enough to get a lattice, uh, but it's not obviously functorial unless one has something like this. Because you don't know if whether it's the same thing. You get the same. Uh, no, I don't know if I get the same thing. We can control the error depending on the dimension and the ramification index of the field. In fact, that's how we do it. We first work with that category. You show that that gives you a lattice, and then show that this other one is sort of off by a bounded amount. <coughs> Painfully. You go through all of de Jong's proof and observe that at each step, you can do this. <laughs> I mean, Gabber told me that he knows how to do this, and maybe he knows a better way. I, I, I don't know. Uh, so it's uh, over, uh, no, but actually, uh, uh, if you do it over a one-dimensional bag and characteristic peak, you have to introduce inseparable uh, yes. things. So this is a tile means after extending to yes. square. But here it's a number field case. But uh, it's, uh, I think if one looks at the case over a field, it's, it's not more or less easy to see that the choices in the Young's original paper over a perfect field case <coughs> come to, to arrange this. And then... Uh, Okay. Then one is just choosing generally now. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, this is. It's, it's really. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's what we did. We just go through each step of the argument and observe that you can make those choices correctly. <laughs> yes? Yes. So, uh, if I understand, so your first construction you mostly use a comparison between the etal cohomology and the RAM cohomology. And the second one is rather between log crystalline cohomology and the RAM cohomology. The second one, it seems natural that maybe it's out of reach to get the derived version of that. Is it to get a complex of the uh, Yeah. Uh, I mean, one can try to define something locally by saying you look at piatic etal cohomology, you tensor up with acris, and then look at derived Galois invariants. Oh, but you can rather with a with a construct, with a construction. No? You know, the first one is hard to believe, and the torsion is completely different. In the, I, I, no, I don't know. I mean, yeah. So you get two, two constructions. So one, one line is bigger than the other one. You, you have some relation between them? Do I have a relation between them? Yeah. I've told you everything I know, which is that if P is sufficiently large in the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But other than that, no, I don't know. Um, well, OK, I mean, there's containment for a stupid reason. Because this one is simultaneously semi-stable on every model. And for the other one, I pick some semi-stable model and then intersect. So it's containment. And they're genuinely small. So I think if you compute the case of an elliptic curve with cuspidal reduction, you get a difference of p. Any more questions?
Okay, let's start the speaker.